Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Andy. I'm the events director of the Oxford Climate Society and a master's student here at Oxford studying environmental change and management. Uh, the Oxford Climate Society is a student organization at Oxford University aiming to develop the next generation of informed climate leaders. In addition to our speaker events, we run educational programs throughout the year, including our School of Climate Change and the world's largest student climate journal, The Anthroposphere. The theme of today's event is climate activism. In the 21st century, climate activism, be it uh, small scale strikes or large scale demonstrations, all hold the potential to be a really effective and powerful tool uh, to combat efforts contributing to environmental degradation and adverse environmental change. So this event uh, seeks to delve deeper into the narratives of some activists on the front lines uh, of the climate activism movement, exploring how effective, direct, and organized action can come about uh, and generate political, moral, as well as practical successes. So joining us today are Disha Ravi and Jessica Kito. Disha Ravi is a 23-year-old climate justice activist with Fridays for Future India uh, and a writer as well. She became an activist after she saw her family impacted by the water crisis. She is best known for advocating for better policies and governance for the climate and environmental sectors. She's passionate about ensuring that voices from MAPA, most affected people in areas, are represented in climate conversations and negotiations. Jessica Kitso is Dine Navajo from the community of Hard Rock within the Black Mesa region of the Navajo Nation in Northeast Arizona. Jessica has been a volunteer on and off with To Nijone Ane, Sacred Water Speaks, since the organization's founding in 2001. It was only in 2017 that Jessica became an organizer for the organization, and she has since helped to coordinate and organize events such as the Just Transition Relay in 2016 or 2017 to garner support for the Navajo Nation, embracing the end of fossil fuels and focusing on the transition to renewables. She has also been involved in the Black Mesa to New York campaign in 2018 uh, to stop Avenue Capital from purchasing the Navajo Generating Station. She, Jessica graduated from Northern Arizona University with her Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science. Aside from dedicating most of her time to nonprofit work, Jessica has also served with the past Navajo Nation president, uh, Russell Begay, as an executive assistant and worked on bringing solar to residents of the Navajo Nation who previously had no access to electricity. Outside of her work with Tona Jona Ane, Jessica enjoys spending time with her family, exploring the outdoors, writing, and reading. Uh, so to begin today's event, we are going to start with two presentations from each of Jessica and Disha, uh, beginning first with Jessica. So whenever you're ready, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, now <laughs> I've got it. Sorry, I'm having technical difficulties. Okay. Um, so can everybody see my screen? Uh, no, so I think you have to, to hit the share screen button. Yeah. Darn. Okay. Does that work? Yeah, can I can see that now. Okay, okay. All right, um, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I would also like to introduce myself in my own language, if that's okay. Yate she'e Jessica Kitsa Yinishia, Shishin Nishlin, Sadesh Gijni Bashishin, Bilagana Dashiche, Pinkatoni Dashinale, Zitlajin Date Nasha. So before we get into um, the, the activism part, I think it's really important to show you um, where I come from and the people that I come from. So the Navajo Nation is located in the Southwest part of the United States. Um, the Navajo Nation is a semi-arid high desert region. We are one of 26, about 26 tribes who live in the Southwest. Uh, the part of the Navajo Nation that I am from it, and where the organization began is a region known as Black Mesa or Zithlajin. 
And this just so shows uh, that area and the communities um, in that area. If, if you look to the, um, at the picture on the right, it's my right. Um, it kind of looks like a hand. It's a, it's, um, it's the darker regions um, on that picture is what's called, is what's known as Black Mesa. So the Navajo people were traditionally a nomadic people. We are pastoralists and the high de or dry desert farmers. Um, this is the lifestyle a lot of my people in the Black Mesa region try to hold on to. Um, we are stewards to horses, sheep, and cows. So the primary predominant vegetation in the area is juniper trees, pine trees, sagebrush, and snakeweed. We have a population of between 300,000 to 500,000 people. Uh, 15,000 homes on the Navajo Nation don't have electricity. 30% to 40% of homes don't have running water. Uh, we only get about six to 16 inches of precipitation per year. And um, historically the people met their water needs from natural seeps and springs. Uh, so earlier you saw a picture of a windmill. So sometime in the early 19, uh, 19, 1900s, the Navajo Nation saw its first windmill. Um, although we have windmills now, uh, most of them are no longer, um, a lot of them are uh, not able to produce water. Um, but up until 60 years ago, we still could get our water from natural seeps and springs. Um, going back to the water, most people on Black Mesa have to haul water now uh, because our seeps and springs are, are no longer producing. And it's typically in, in water barrels and water trailers like you see here in front of um, or on the side of this uh, traditional hogan or home that Navajo people live in. Um, on average, people have to haul water uh, from designated watering points about 15 to 30 miles away on unpaved roads. Uh, these designated watering points also require us to pay. So we pay about one cent per gallon. And again, people have to haul water for themselves and for their animals. So naturally, we know how to conserve um, our water. And on average, Navajo households of four use about five to 10 gallons per day, whereas the average American uses 82 gallons per day. So back in 1999, the organization's founders had all returned back to Black Mesa. Uh, they were fresh out of college and they were eager to be a part of the communities, their, their communities again. They started talking to their elders and attending local community meetings or chapter meetings as we call them. Um, at this time, it came to their attention that the natural seeps and springs around Black Mesa were no longer producing. So the elders who were closest to the land acted like canaries in the mine, basically, alerting the organization's founders to this revelation that all of our water was, was drying up. Um, and after carefully investigating, it was discovered that the coal mine old, owned by Peabody Coal Company that is also located, located on Black Mesa was using water to slurry coal. Uh, 
the mining operation had been around since the 1960s. So it was just sort of like operating, operating, operating away in the background. Um, and it was not known that they were using high amounts of water in their operation. The knowledge of the knowledge of this is what started our organization. So Tonajona Anne is translated as Sacred Water Speaks. Our mission is to preserve, protect the environment, land, water, sky, and people, and advocate for the responsible use of the natural resources of Zitlajin or Black Mesa. Um, again, the organization initially began to protect the Navajo sandstone aquifer, uh, which is the only source of drinking water for the people in the region. It's the source where, it's the source of water where all the natural seeps and springs were coming from. Um, so the coal company Peabody uh, was using the water as a transportation medium in a slurry line that began in Black Mesa and ended in Laughlin, Nevada. So the slurry, slurry line was about 273 miles long. Um, some other great facts is that uh, the Navajo aquifer naturally met um, EPA standards. Um, and since 1999, the the organization's scope of work and influence has expanded across the Navajo Nation. So we're no longer just working within Black Mesa. We've, we're working throughout the Navajo Nation and it's a territory that spans four different states, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado. And now our work also encompasses just transition, uh, food sovereignty and climate activism. So here again is, this is what the slurry, slurry line looks like. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, uh, it's a lot of infrastructure and technology in a place that uh, doesn't have it. <laughs> Cause like I said, a, a lot of people don't even have access to running water or electricity um, in this region. Uh, so most indigenous communities play host to a lot of these industries, um, such as coal, natural gas, oil, and uranium. And uh, this map, I'm sorry it's blurry, but it basically shows uh, the Navajo Nation, the Hopi tribe, which is within the Navajo Nation. Um, it shows the four states, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona. And then the, the, um, the black mounds are coal fire power plants. And you can see that on the Navajo Nation, there's Black Mesa coal, coal mine. And that's the coal, um, coal mine operation that Peabody owns. And if you see the, the dotted line, you can see the slurry line and how it goes to Mojave. Um, so here's just a little bit more information about the in aquifer. It's a really deep aquifer. Um, all of these different communities, Kienta, Black Mesa, Forest Lake, Tuba City, they all rely on the in aquifer as a water source. So going back to um, the coal mining operation, on Black Mesa, the coal that was dug out from Black Mesa fed the Navajo, gen or not Navajo, Mojave Generating Station, sorry. Um, and that's the generating station that was in Laughlin, Nevada. <clears throat> um, it powered uh, cities such as Tucson, Phoenix, and Southern California. So the coal, which belongs to Navajo, was taken to Laughlin, Nevada and burned and created electricity 
for all these really major cities. And then Navajo Nation, the Navajo people, the people who do have electricity have to go back around and pay for that energy back to them. So they don't, they don't get it um, at a lower cost and they don't get it for free, even though it's their coal and their water that they, that we sacrifice. Um, oh, and let me just go back really quick. Um, so the organization started in 1999, sorry. The organization started in 1999 um, through our work of just bringing awareness to this whole operation and to the fact that they were using our water, um, put a lot of pressure on Mojave Generating Station. And through a combination of um, our efforts, along with um, federal pressure to put retrofit technology on Mojave Generating Station, um, Mojave Generating Station decided to close. So they closed in 2005. So you would think that um, Peabody would also close their operation, but they actually expanded their, their coal mining operation. And um, they're one of the largest open pit mines on earth. Uh, they decided that since they could no longer send their coal to Mojave, they found another coal fire power plant called Navajo Generating Station, which is located in um, Page, Arizona. And so we have the largest coal, coal strip mining operation along with the largest power plant in the Southwest and the largest emitter of greenhouse gases. So our work just naturally through our work of trying to protect our water, we just naturally kind of fell into the realm of climate change because uh, coal-fired power plants represent the nation's largest source of carbon dioxide. And by, by allowing these operations to keep running, it, you know, it, it further exacerbates our the climate challenges that we are gonna face. And Navajo people, or not Navajo, indigenous people in general are the ones that are, are the communities that are most vulnerable to climate change. And we feel the impacts first and we feel it the hardest. Um, so in our region, higher temperatures will increase water demands. Uh, It'll increase drought, duration, and intensity. It'll decrease precipitation, increasing severity of wet periods and floods, and decrease aquifer recharge. And that's really important to us because according to USGS and um, a hydrologist that we work with by the name of Daniel Higgins, our aquifer, the in aquifer, is already is already in a state of drawdown. And we have no idea when, when it will, when we'll see a recharge. <clears throat> so, so that's sort of like the history of our organization. And that happened when I was like in middle school. So I was, <laughs> I was not, super aware of it. Um, and I started really working for the organization uh, in 2017. And um, so uh, forgive me if I get a little bit more excited because I was actually at some of these events that I'm gonna show you. Um, so we started doing, we still do a lot of community outreach. Uh, we, a lot of the, um, and a lot of the industries and a lot of our opponents have sort of accused us of being um, 
like they're they always tell us like oh you guys are like the no people and I think that's just like kind of like a general perspective that people have of climate activists and so we always try to um have solutions when we're when we get the opportunity to come to the table either at the community level the state level the federal the federal level and um yeah so we we're fighting for these operations like coal for natural gas for oil for uranium um to all like eventually shut down as quickly as possible but we also are trying to find solutions and that's where like our renewable energy efforts are are come in um since the organization started we've had a lot of we go we go to a lot of meetings <laughs> and um we meet a lot of people and talk to a lot of people uh we do direct action we um we uh do um yeah and here's we so this is uh an event called the just transition relay um where we rode to our central government on horseback and on bike and by foot so this is just a great way to get our community involved and um our animals involved <laughs> and our our elders and our youth and they all like to come together and and talk about all of these issues Yeah, so here's just more pictures of our events. Um, <clears throat> okay, so through the work that we've done, and I think it's a combination of what's happening now at like the political realm and what's happening in in our in the economics part of it also but also um the work that we've done to bring attention to water coal just transition and climate issues on the navajo nation i also think have made a really big impact and so this is the same map that we saw at the beginning of you know the coal coal fire power plants surrounding the Navajo Nation and the Navajo Generating Station has since closed down. Um, Reed Gardner, Mojave, uh, Black Mesa is now in the decommissioning stage um, or reclamation stage. Um, Escalante is closed. Uh, and then the other coal fire power plants have scheduled closing dates. So here's the picture of Mojave Generating Station, the largest emitter in, of greenhouse gases in the Southwest was decommissioned in 2019. Navajo Generating Station. No, sorry, Navajo Generating Station. Um, so yeah, and then uh, I think that the, the strength and the, I would say the, the, yeah, the strength and the, the power and the resilience of our work comes from the fact that we are indigenous people. We, at the end of the day, at the end of um, protesting or whatever, we come back to our homes and um, we never lose the perspective of how close we live with the natural world and how to continuously strive to live in harmony with it.
And I also think that when you fight, when you fight for the elements of life, it naturally leads you to, um, it naturally leads you to climate change and climate activism. Yeah, I hope that was within a good amount of time. Yeah, thank you. That was super helpful. It was really interesting to learn a little bit more about the history of the organization, as well as uh, I really like what you said about the importance of bringing solutions to the table and not just uh, saying no in activism. So uh, yeah, thank you for that perspective. Adisha, whenever you're ready, feel free to, to give your presentation. Thank you. Um, honestly, and that was so incredibly powerful. I lost you there because my internet was a little fuzzy, but it was really powerful. Um, I'm, I'm good to start. One second. I don't have a presentation, um, but and I know the organizers actually asked me to speak about uh, how to organize movement and all of that. Uh, but I think with what's happening at COP26, what I wanted to talk about is how um, just generally people of color and uh, black people and indigenous people have been treated at COP and how, you know, the larger conversations around climate are still focused on our future when millions of people are dying today. And this, what this essentially does is it underestimates um, the climate crisis and also does a grave injustice to the communities, to the millions of people who are you know, suffering because of the climate crisis today. And COP26 is taking place in Glasgow right now. And it's a climate negotiation where less than 0.001% of the population will negotiate with our lives. And that is literally what they're going to do, negotiate. And they will get to decide who gets to live and who gets to die. And they essentially become the new gods of our time. And a lot of them keep saying that they want to keep, uh, you know, the rise in temperatures below two degrees. But the truth is the one, the difference of 0 0.5 degrees between 1.5 degrees and 2.2 degrees is where the global south will live and they, it will die. And this is because we are currently at 1.2 and it's already hell for us. Millions of people are already dying. Um, as I speak, there are, there's flooding going on in Chennai from the past three days. Last week, it was Kerala. On the same week, it was also Uttarakhand in India. And, and before that, it was my own city, Bangalore, and the airport got flooded because we experienced increased rainfall in our region. And this hasn't happened before. Uh, I mean, it's been happening now, but it hasn't happened in the last decade. And this isn't an infrastructural problem. This is because of increased rainfall, which can be, um, which experts have actually linked to climate change. And despite this, the mainstream focus by media houses, by even activists, especially white activists and policy experts, is on the future when millions are in my own country, that's just my own country, uh, uh, are dying today. The warp focus on the future is because people would much rather care about the white children's future than the brown children's, brown people of color, indigenous people, their uh, present. And if this is to continue, we've already lost. And this isn't the first time it's happening, even in it, this COP, has been declared the most exclusionary cop because they have been so hard for people in the global south to access. Um, with my work in Fridays for Future, it was honestly the hardest cop for us to get in. Um, more of, we currently have three representatives over there, two of them indigenous people from our, uh, from communities in Chhattisgarh who've had to face the climate impacts firsthand. And, they've hardly made it to mainstream media. 
even though they spoke at the speak they spoke at the Fridays for Future rallies, they haven't been represented. And this is because no one, it's very, it's become very clear that people of color and people from the global south aren't needed there. And they didn't want them, they didn't want us or them to be there. And I couldn't be there because uh, my passport was withheld by the police. So there is a common theme in climate conversations and negotiations. And it's not the first time, like Vanessa Nakate was cut out of pictures and panels that she took part when the white activists in those panels were, you know, given a web platform. And it's the, it's the same repeating theme of where they, where they focus on the future and where they focus on white people. And environmental racism has sweeped so deep that it is what has prevented the climate action of any sort because we are so focused on the future that we have refused to acknowledge how, uh, just how grave the issue is at the moment. Like on... In COP on November 1st, our Prime Minister, my Prime Minister from India, Narendra Modi, announced India's commitments at COP. He pledged net zero by 2070 and with a reduction of 1 billion tons of carbon emissions by 2030 and an increase in share of electricity generated by solar, wind and other non-fossil fuel sources which was very odd because in India was one of the many countries lobbying the UN to make sure that fossil fuels aren't phased out and they are in the climate plan. And I just don't know how that's going to work out because fossil fuels are the reason for climate crisis. And most of the targets he set were so ambitious and we were so inconsistent with what is backing at what is happening back at home because what's happening back at home is nothing short of a horror show. Um, India has been diluting environmental policies back home and these policies have endangered people who are on the front line of the climate crisis. His policies have it essentially increased ease of doing business and his policies have opened up uh, businesses, infrastructure, all of which are damaging the, the climate and the environment. And this has further pushed the climate crisis and this has further pushed those on the front line of the climate crisis to suffer the worst impacts of it all. And I don't want to get into the policies, but he's passed uh, he, I mean, he, the, the Ministry of Environment essentially passed uh, amendments to the environmental impact policy, which weakened the public participation. So what they essentially did was, uh, the uh, normally if you were to build an infrastructure, you will have to um, get permissions. And one of the permissions is uh, they have to map out the environmental impact that project will have on people. And, uh, open it up for public participation because if they're going to expand a road near my house, I will I, I will have to know what that is going to entail for me. So once they release that uh, assessment, I get to engage in a process where I understand what it will mean for me and I get to object the project. Uh, but they completely did away with public hearings. So if they want to steal land from Indigenous people, they can do so without having to take any permissions like the situation is already worse they've been stealing land from Adivasis who are the indigenous communities in India for years and they every time someone someone fights against it or even raises their opinions against it they are being punished for it so this law would make it so inaccessible for people to fight for their own homes and you know the, when we when we had Fridays for Future India uh, you know, race against it. And this was during the pandemic and they made the, the policy they passed was actually quite inaccessible to people because they only passed it in English. And a lot of the country is doesn't speak English because we have a variety of languages. They didn't translate it. And we had to do the job of translation. It was in the middle of a pandemic. So we couldn't, and they were locked down. So we couldn't go out on the streets and endanger people by protesting physically. 
So they had to, we had to email them objections that the form, that's the form they um, allowed us. And we did, we, we consulted with experts and we set up an email, um, essentially like an email thing on our website where you could just go read what the issue is and send it an email. And because we gathered almost 20 lakh emails, okay, I don't know the number of conversion, we have lakhs in India, but um, we mobilized a lot of people. They put the uh, terrorism charges on FF India last year for sending emails. And it was quite funny to, I mean, it was not funny then, it's, it's funny now, but it was funny to read, um, you know, the charge sheet, that the FIR they had sent us, the notice. Um, it read that us sending emails, objecting the draft was a threat to the peace and sovereignty of India. And it made us question how ridiculously fragile the peace and sovereignty of India should be if they, it was going to be threatened by emails. And it took us quite, and we, we didn't know how to deal with it. We never had to in the past uh, of this extent. And it took us a lot of legal support from lawyers who came out and helped us pro bono. Um, and we eventually got that notice withdrawn and charges withdrawn, but UAPA is the worst, the, the, the charges they put was UAPA, which is Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, which calls a person a terrorist. It is the hardest um, act for someone to get a bail on. Uh, the police don't need any evidence to, you know, to arrest you. They don't even need any, they don't even need any arrest reason to keep you uh, locked up in prison. And the soonest anyone's gotten bail on the UAPA is one year. And that's only happened once in the history of India. Um, everyone else, it's been, the average is around eight to nine years. So we could have been locked up for eight to nine years for sending emails. And that's the state of what the country is at. And this, they didn't, he didn't stop there. He went on to dilute the Forest Conservation Act this year which again would endanger tribal communities and in, increase the conflicts uh, that who, of, of tribal communities who lived in the forest and dependent on the forest for their livelihoods. And he, they also passed the coastal regulation, um, another policy related to coastal regions, which, were, which was already diluted from 2011 to 2019. And it got 90% objections and all of them were uh, completely overlooked and the policy was passed in the first place. And they further are amending it now. It just came out in October. And it is going, every single amendment they've made to that policy is has opened up the coast for destruction. And one thing this has done especially is how badly it's impacted the Kohli fishing communities who are another indigenous community in India. Um, and what, is, what it has done to their livelihoods, it's completely shut off the coal because they're building a huge road, which is totally unnecessary. Um, and it has to pass through these fishing communities and their villages and their houses have been upturned and they've had to lose their livelihoods just yesterday, like last week, there was a new report on how they had to shut down and they couldn't continue on with their uh, fishing. That is their only source of income. That is all they have been doing for ages and all of that completely lost. And I get that policy may not be the most interesting thing to talk about, but it's been cutting them, cutting their cutting people's livelihoods off in millions. But our prime minister went to COP and, you know, um, made all of these very, very colorful promises that are so far away from reality and so untrue of what is happening on ground. It's so inconsistent. It's ambitious, sure, but words are words and actions are another thing. And this is essentially what the state of India is. And last week, and this is, and anyone who get who even raises, you know, their voice against it, 
gets punished for doing that. And I, I know this because I was arrested earlier this year and I'm not legally allowed to talk about my arrest, but I was in prison for 10 days and that is considered a short amount of time. And I was very, very lucky and I'm very, very grateful to be out, but my charges are still going on. I still have to appear in court every so often. My passport was withheld and I still haven't gotten it. It's been almost 80 days, I think, since I applied for a passport. Um, I never had one before and I had to go through two court hearings. I had the police visit me twice and I had to write a response to why um, they came up with a very feeble excuse as to why I'm not getting my passport. And I had to, you know, get more lawyers on board to write an write a response to that. And this is what it means to be an activist in the global south. We are already feeling the impacts of the climate crisis and the very, very bad policies are pushing us further into the brink of it. And we are like, the climate crisis is here for us. It's not a matter of our future, it is our present. We're not just fighting for our future, we're fighting for our present, but still, all you see at COP, all you see at all of these new me news media outlets is, and even activists, even a lot of global North activists, is the focus on their future and how selfish do you have to be to not talk about the realities of millions of people who've been displaced, who've lost their lives, who've lost families, who've lost their homes, and life as they know it has been upturned, but the focus is still on the future. And I personally think that to, you, you know, even have a shot at climate action and even have a shot at solving the climate crisis, we need to change conversations around it. We need to acknowledge that the climate crisis is already here. We need to acknowledge that millions are feeling the impact. And only when we start acknowledging the climate crisis, will we be able to act on it? So we desperately need to change climate conversations to, to enable climate action because we're not just fighting for our future, we're fighting for our present. Thank you so much for really everything that you just said. I think it was super powerful and super honest. Uh, and I just wanna thank you for, for sharing all your stories with us. So you said a lot that we can dive into right now, but I, something that uh, I really want to ask you about is this element of the violence being perpetuated against activists worldwide. Really, we're seeing from Extinction Rebellion activists in the UK to youth strikers uh, like yourself in India that climate activists are being criminalized, they're being taunted, uh, but at the same time, companies and uh, even states are, that are breaking these international agreements set out in the Paris Accords and uh, others are largely not being held accountable. So I'm wondering, uh, Disha, what do you think our legal systems, or, or do you think our legal systems need to include some sort of notion of climate protection and justice? Uh, and how, uh, you know, how should activists be protected under the law in ways that they aren't right now? Honestly, I firstly think that activists in general, not necessarily climate, but any activists in general need to be protected. Our freedom of speech, our right to dissent, our right um, to, you know, call out and hold our leaders accountable is a right that we need to be protested, protected against because it not, it's not just limited to, you know, activists. It's also extends to citizens who criticize the government for their work. We have every right to do that. And criminalizing criticism and dissent in any form isn't the way to go forward. It is It shows the weakening of a democracy and the essence of a democracy and the sign of a healthy democracy is in fact healthy criticism. So I think if activists or anyone who has um, criticized in any, any policy, any any statement by any government should be welcomed because you sh they should be happy because we are engaging in the country's policies and the we are engaging in a democratic process and that is what we're supposed to be. India is the biggest democracy and we need to uphold that and we can only do that by welcoming objections. 
And Jessica, I just want to pose the, the same question to you. Uh, how is the legal system in your experience failing uh, activists or even just you know, community members and particularly within uh, the US setting, if you have anything to say about that? Um, yeah, I, of course, indigenous people have to deal with um, the fact that, you know, our, our treaty rights are being violated. Uh, and, um, and for the Navajo Nation in particular, I mean, our Navajo Nation government was created by the US to, um, to allow leasing of natural gas. So it's, I kind of like to describe it as just the shell, you know, like the United States has the constitution and it has like all these different rules and regulations. It, the Navajo Nation is sort of just like a shell of the US and some of those rights for humans or for, for, for people um, didn't like translate over. So the Navajo Nation, um, the communities and the people, uh, especially um, during times when there's like energy development happening, uh, a lot of the people and the communities, they kind of just get pushed to the side and the consultation um, process is not really followed in, in those instances. Uh, yeah, and Disha, just to circle back to COP, uh, you know, obviously we all know that there are huge access issues plaguing this COP in particular, uh, but in your activism, you highlight that uh, the climate crisis always intersects with so many other injustices like casteism, sexism, ableism. So do you think that uh, some of the solutions being discussed at this COP, uh, for instance, carbon pricing mechanisms or other uh, other financial uh, mechanisms being discussed miss the point or are inadequate uh, and don't really take into account uh, these intersections and this intersectionality? Uh, and if so, in what ways and, and how do you think that that can be remedied? I don't see them, you know, uh, talking about intersectionality at all. If anyone at COP uh, has spoken about intersectionality, it's only the activists who are there. It's not anyone, uh, you know, none of the world leaders, none of the, you know, the policy experts or negotiators are talking about intersectionality because they're not, they're not even addressing the climate crisis, let alone how it's going to intersect with other injustices. So um, at this point, um, I don't even know, COP has become this, PR exercise for world leaders to just measure, oh, oh my God, we're doing so much for the climate, but in reality, they're not doing anything. Like um, today, uh, I think, I mean, old president, ex-president Barack Obama was at COP and he, I'm, I still have a badge, so I still get the emails. And, you know, he invited uh, people to come and uh, to his gathering, especially young people. And, but his event was ticketed that was expensive and that only could be afforded by, you know, or uh, big oil companies that are there. And I also found out that there are more oil company uh, delegates than, I don't know if they're called delegates, but essentially more people from lobbyists from the oil company than any person from, uh, you know, countries put together. So, how are we even going to talk about intersectionality when these are the people, the villains who caused the climate crisis are the ones deciding all of this? And they, you know, when we talk about reparation, he actually did speak about finance and climate finance, but he didn't talk about how the US is going to support global South countries. He just keeps talking about finance. I'm like, where is it going to come from? Who's paying who? Define that. So it's all just re really flowery words that don't, you know, talk about anything. None of the, I mean, like, I mean, recently it was loss and damages. I think it's still loss and damages. And that, this is where they're supposed to discuss about intersectionality. This is how they're supposed to discuss how, you know, um, flooding especially and other 
cla- climate cla- calamities are impacting some women more and they're causing climate brides call- causing sexual trafficking of women and how they're going to address it how they're going to pay for all of this pay- compensate people nothing that wasn't even brought up and i can the standard isn't even uh, the minimum the standard is so so far away from you know the reaching the minimum so i don't even know when they're going to reach in- intersectionality or if they're going to reach it and i really don't expect them to understand it and uh you know jessica we obviously saw a huge a youth rally a couple of days ago in cop um and so that perhaps makes some of the the emissions and the failures that dish was just talking about are particularly disappointing in light of all that energy uh but just zooming out a little bit more you know those activists obviously were comfortable putting uh their bodies out there and uh, really getting in the streets uh, and protesting but as we know that there are so many different levels and ways to engage uh with climate activism that doesn't necessarily uh, involve the same amount of personal uh, risk and so i'm wondering uh, how do you think about engaging people who uh maybe you know are just wanting to get involved in the movement at a more casual level uh, all the way to those people that are out in the streets that are uh protesting that are rallying how do we make space for all of those people in uh our our collective climate movements um ooh that's a that's a really big question um <laughs> uh, so gosh um i always get asked this question and i know i know the I guess I'm just coming from a point a point of view um from an indigenous point of view and we the culture and the tradition and how we how we um the way that we I guess do our activism is from that standpoint from a a cultural and a traditional perspective we use um we use a lot of in in the activism activism we do we try to use a lot of our own language we use a system called ke which is a relationship system and how we um interact with one another um it it defines our relationship with um not only other navajos but um other uh other non navajos and um also like the natural world so uh we use that system a lot when we're in certain when we're in spaces and we're given the opportunity to speak um we acknowledge all of those different things um and then when people who are not indigenous come forward and say well how 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 can we get involved and and it's just a matter of like it's just a matter of opening up that conversation that dialogue of you know what's what's everybody's capacity because everybody has the capacity to affect this uh climate crisis that we're in and um knowing what people's capacity is um and trying to understand like where they're coming from um yeah and it's just holding those spaces and making sure that people have a voice i would say it's a lot of sense thank you and disha you know at the same at the same um i guess similarly to how there are multiple ways to engage with the climate movement uh, there are also different tactics that you can use as well and so i want to ask you in particular about when you you think about using direct intervention versus a more polite uh, cordial engagement style like perhaps the the type that we see at cop. So how do you think about uh, either of those tactics when it might be appropriate to apply uh and to what situations that they might be applied to? Um I think both of them are really effective. Um I think we need to be doing absolutely everything we can um and using different tactics to address the climate crisis. And obviously like some of them will work differently and but I think you know we've had 
like my country especially has had a huge history of protests of um going out on the streets getting people together organizing uh civil discourse and i think that's worked really well but protests are often also um a lead up to conversations with who you're challenging and um opening that door they may not agree with you you may not agree with them often it's both the sides not agreeing with each other but it is important to have those conversations and it's important to see um if you can move them and i think protests are uh, the start of it and conversations are the end of it because you keep pushing them you keep bringing people together until they meet your demands because honestly our demands are for clean air and water and that's that's the bare, the bare minimum that shouldn't be something we are not met um so that are that aren't met so yeah yeah it's a really important point because i think a lot of people uh, fall into this this notion that protests are sometimes uh, useless but actually we can see that they do in fact uh, push the door open just a little bit for some of those conversations to be had uh, but jessica do you have any any other thoughts on that question of uh, those differing tactics and when you might think about using them yeah so i i totally agree um uh with uh disha she's listening to her is awesome <laughs> um uh, so we, again, we, we do, you know, we do do uh, direct and indirect action. Um, and it's just, it's, I would say that it takes, you have to, you have to sort of get the lay of the land and figure out who you're talking to and um and then also it just from our perspective it also it, it includes like consulting with um our 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 organization founders our advisors um our board members like elders from the community like we, we were wanting to do like direct action. We're wanting to do protests. We wanna be more aggressive. Is this, is this the right time and place to do that? And, um, you know, we keep all of those in our, in our organization, we keep all of those, um, like all that advice in mind before we go out and like do something really loud and like, kind of uh, um, more aggressive. And, um, and I think it's just our, our leaders and our elders just know, I guess, like what the right tone is and what, what is needed in the moment. And, um, and that's, where, that's where a lot of our, how we do a lot of our activism, I would say if that makes sense, sorry. It definitely does. Uh, so just being mindful of time, I wanna to push us into the, the Q&A for some audience questions. Uh, the first is directed towards uh, Jessica. So do you think that there is enough recognition of uh, the psychological and emotional violence that indigenous activists face beyond uh, the mere physical abuse? Um. I think that, I mean, it's always helpful to, to, to think about those things and to sort of be aware of those things, especially um, for me as an organizer, I'm, I try to be aware of those things if I'm like organizing a group of people, uh, especially indigenous people, especially people from my community, like we, because of um, fossil fuel extraction and the fact that you know people have been forced off of their land to make room for these industries, 
um, the fact that they've had their water taken away, they've had, and now loved ones taken away, like from uh, the pollution, like a lot of our elders have passed because of, um, because of uh, like uh, respiratory diseases and um, cancer and different things like that. Like it leaves, it leaves, it puts a lot of weight on people's um, emotional and mental capacities. And uh, especially for indigenous people, because we just feel those losses so much. We're, we're a really tight knit community. We have really tight family structures. And then on top of that, we see the destruction of our natural environment. And that's just almost the that's like the same as like losing a family member. And um, so people carry that a lot and I try to be aware of those things. And so when people are having a hard time, like we just, we try to be there for each other and we've lost a lot of, um, we've lost a couple of activists uh, due to like the, the mental um, strain that they're on. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's always important to remember those things. And do I think that there's enough attention to it? Um, probably not, and especially if you're if you're looking for those like facilities that help with that kind of thing. Like those things are not present, like especially on indigenous communities. Like we don't have a place where people can go to to readily gain access to like therapy or anything like that. Um, but I mean, there's a lot of, I also wanna acknowledge that there's a lot of, um, I guess alternatives, not, well, I guess there's a lot of solutions also within, if you, if you have a community like mine, who's really like holding on to their tradition and their culture, there's a lot of um, solutions and relief and remedies that can be found within your, your own native cultures. Thank you for sharing this perspective. It's really insightful. Uh, so Disha, just paraphrasing this question a little bit, but do you think that making terms and definitions of climate change more readily available to everyday people, so educating the masses is as important as holding governments and officials accountable uh, in, in terms of driving for large scale change or what, where do you see as a, a higher leverage point? I do think it's as important because there were uh, recent reports that show that people don't engage with um, climate activism or even just conversations around environment and climate because, the, because of the amount of jargons we have and because it makes it so inaccessible to common people and when you do that, you're, you're leaving out a whole section of society who are also impacted by the climate crisis, who, um, who can hold the governments accountable, right? And I think that is super, super important. So the climate movement is only going to succeed when all of us contribute to it in whatever capacity we can. It needs absolutely everyone uh, because it is our shared planet. So everyone needs to engage in whatever uh, capacity they can. Like I think Jessica said the same thing. And it is super, super important to ensure that we make knowledge of climate and environment accessible to people. So it's important to simplify the terms we're currently using because it's leaving out a whole section. That's what COP is, right? A lot of people, even activists who are there for the first time or even like journalists who are there for the first time don't really know how uh, to fully report on it or write about it or understand what's happening because it's filled with so many um, jargony words that no one really knows what's happening. And that's how they have been fooling us for this long. Uh, that's a great point. Uh, and just, you know, to kind of to bring us home here, I want to ask each of you uh, one last question, uh, starting with Jessica, uh, but the same question posed to both of you is uh, what key pieces of advice do you have to other activists um, as we move forward uh, in the 21st century with COP going, COP going on? 
um, all these other things that we see happening in the world today. Uh, what are your key uh, words of wisdom that you have to impart to those people? Um, I would say, uh, <laughs> uh, I would say keep fighting the good fight. <laughs> It, uh, and it's a, it can feel really lonely a lot of times, but there's a, there, there are a lot of people out there who, um, who are just as concerned about the climate crisis as you are. And, um, and it's really important to, to maintain, I know with COVID, it's really hard to try to meet um, and get together and make those connections, but any way you can, like we we're doing a lot of like social media stuff, um, and, uh, reaching out in that way. And then of course, like, um, gathering, but only like limited number of people with masks and everything like that. But I mean, just keep trying to keep those connections, um, with your allies, with your friends, uh, we can't go at this alone. Um, and if you're, if you're, uh, a part of, uh, an indigenous community, uh, or, um, yeah, if you're a part of an indigenous community, like hold on to your culture, hold on to your language, um, and your traditions. Cause like those things are going to, those things are needed and they're going to keep being needed into the future because this this system that we are under right now is not is not conducive to to justice and equity and it's not it's not going to solve the climate crisis like we we need to, we need those um we need the indigenous knowledge and it's it's going to be needed yeah thanks yeah, I really like what you said about holding on to your language. I think it really anchors you to your identity uh, and makes the activism all that much more meaningful. Uh, but Disha, do you have any any last words to say about that? Yeah, I think what Jessica said was absolutely true and it's definitely helped me as well. Um, and this is an advice. So what I want to say is something I, I got from someone else that when I was going full steam ahead and I was getting burnt out, um, so, uh, an older environmentalist told me that this fight is a marathon and not a sprint. Um, and I think a lot more, a lot of people need to realize that because we go full steam ahead and it is necessary to do that. But a lot of times it comes at the cost of you know, our own health, our mental health, our physical health and our relationship with, you know, our family and loved ones. And that can impact that uh, on us badly and we need to stay in this for the long haul. So I think it's important to focus on um, ourselves and as well as the climate, because if you can take care of your home, that is your body, will you only then will you be able to take care of, you know, our home, which is our planet. I lost uh, my life, the sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the message about it being a marathon and not a sprint is very, very relevant. Uh, especially in light of negotiations today, which seem to to drag out uh, and not always produce material gains. And so just to keep that in mind, that's that's a really good point. Uh, but just to close up, I want to say a really huge thanks to, to Jessica and Disha for joining us today, uh, giving us some of their time and really providing a very interesting insights into the challenges and opportunities of uh, climate activism today. And so to so our audience, I hope that you've enjoyed tonight's event. Uh, we will be having another next week at the same time. Uh, with that, I'll bring this one to a close uh, and just want to reiterate, thanks a lot to our guests and to our audience for joining us today. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Andy.